This is a pre-recorded webinar featuring moderator Steve Pine with presenters Dan Riley, Jason Church, and Melody Gayeski. All materials used by our presenters will be available for download. I think we move on now to our next speaker, who is uh, Jason Church. Jason is uh, Chief of Technical Services at NCPTT. Many of us know Jason and worked with him for years. Uh, he, is, uh, he coordinates and works to further develop the center's National Cemetery Training Initiative, which I've taken part in and I could recommend highly. It's, it's an incredible uh, resource and much needed. And uh, he does other uh, uh, related research with that, but is, uh, has his fingers in a lot of pies. Uh, before joining NCPTT, he was a conservator and historic metals expert for the city of Savannah, Georgia. Uh, in the Department of Cemeteries. He's earned an MFA in Historic Preservation from S uh, Savannah College of Art and Design and uh, a BS in Building Science uh, from Appalachian State University. Jason is a professional associate of the American Institute for Conservation and an active member of the National Heritage Responders. So uh, Jason has assisted with disaster response and recovery for some of our most devastating storms over the years uh, as a volunteer for those National Heritage Responders. And uh, I, I believe that he's going to have a lot of information to share with us. And at this point, I'll turn it over to Jason. For the visually impaired, the following is a slide-based presentation. All materials used are available for download in your WebEx browser. Hello, my name is Jason Church, and I'm with the National Center for Preservation Technology and Training. And today I'm going to talk about preparedness for cultural institutions. So in this presentation, we're going to talk about what you as an institution can do to better prepare your collections and yourself and your building uh, for disasters or emergencies. All right, so my favorite saying is to be proactive, not reactive. As my father always said, the best defense is a good offense. And that's very, very true for collections. So we want to be prepared and ready as best we can before anything happens. Because uh, if we wait till after it's happened, we're already behind. All right, so what happens when you have to face the unthinkable? So this is emotionally really, really difficult. I've worked disasters and I've had my own at my own uh, with my own collections and I know how emotionally draining and daunting this can be. So we're going to try our best to be proactive and ready so that that helps a little bit uh, get over. So when we walk into work and we have a scene like this and, and by the way this is a real institution and that's really uh, their curation uh, records. What are we going to do? So we're going to talk a little bit about that, and hopefully uh, in prior planning, we can be ready, or at least somewhat ready. So the first thing we're going to talk about is types of emergencies and disasters, so man-made versus natural, uh, unexpected, anticipated, or just totally out of nowhere. So for some things like a large-scale event, like a wildfire or a hurricane, we can sort of plan for that. We know areas that might be at risk. Uh, we can see imminent danger coming sometimes. And then other times, for example, uh, the photograph of me draining water from a photography collection is just those emergencies that happen when a water main breaks overnight and fills your institution with 10 feet of water uh, overnight. And these things happen. So what are we going to do about it? And the reality is with emergencies, they're highly probable. It's probably going to happen at some point. Um, are you going to know what to do? The advantage of emergencies is they're usually minor impact, localized. And the positive thing is you're probably the only institution around that's had this issue. So when that happens, you've got a greater chance of volunteers coming in or services being available to you, local conservators that can come over. Whereas if there's a large scale disaster, everyone's in trouble. Everyone's got their own collection to worry about. Uh, you've got 
you know, every tree crew in town is busy, fire, police, all of these um, institutions are busy, uh, conservators are running everywhere, they're trying to secure their own home, that sort of thing. So we really, really need to plan ahead for disasters because so many um, things won't be available to you when that happens. And it could be something very minor. For example, in my photograph here, this is a local church uh, that I had to, that I went and helped with that just had the problem that their air conditioning got off and all of a sudden they had mold bloom in the building and they definitely weren't expecting it. And it adversely affected both woodwork and works of art, something that no one was ready for. So some of the man-made disasters or emergencies, uh, of course, plumbing leaks, that's a, a bad one. Um, I don't have it on here, but HVAC failures, for example, the air conditioning uh, that I just talked about, or uh, there's a famous museum that a few things were written about a few years ago where they had a, a furnace that blew soot back into the co collections through the HVAC system. And of course, accidents that could be train derailing, uh, car accidents, things like that. Of course, system failures. That's the HVAC I talked about. Robbery, theft, vandalism. Uh, all of these are, are real things that could happen at, at any time. So what are, what are we thinking about and doing to prepare for those? And of course, natural disasters, floods and earthquakes and hurricanes and wildfires. And one thing that we don't talk about very often, but pest infestation. Um, and sometimes these things are actually coming together. Unfortunately, they stack. I know I did a lot of work in Puerto Rico after hurricanes, and we had huge roving groups of termites that came into museums in the aftermath of the hurricane that we didn't expect. So museums that had uh, fantastic facilities all of a sudden had uh, termite infestations inside their collections, inside their buildings, because those termites were looking for new homes, they were moving around with the flooding and that sort of thing. So sometimes these actually stagger and, and can come in together. So what can be planned for? Personally, I kind of think, uh, now that I rethink the slide, I think it all can be planned for to some extent. Um, so things like power failures, do we have a backup plan for that? You know, you may have a collection that's so sensitive that a minor power failure could adversely affect uh, some of the collections. So that's a really important thing. That's something that maybe it's not expected, maybe it's not anticipated, but we could definitely plan for it. We could have a backup system for that. All right, so in planning, what's most vulnerable? If we're looking at our collection, if we're thinking about our institution, what is the thing that we're most concerned with? What is our biggest priority? Is there any way to, to prepare for that with an oncoming disaster? Do we have any sort of disaster plan? So for example, I was on the emergency response team for the city of Savannah, Georgia, for the Department of Cemeteries. There's nothing we can do, of course, for the hundreds of thousands of headstones and sculptures that we have. But one of our biggest risk is, risk is all the burial records. So what do we do with those if a hurricane's coming? So they have a disaster plan. Their plan, all of the records are stored in fire safes. They actually go into a trailer and they go to Thomasville, Georgia. And that's where they stay with two employees during a hurricane. Now, there's nothing we can do about our, you know, amazing sculpture collection, but we can do something about our most vulnerable uh, asset, and that is the burial records. So what does our collection entail? What do we have? What kind of artifacts or, or artwork? Um, we talk here, business paperwork. Do you have the inventories, photographic records, loan agreements, things that your inventory that shows what's yours, what's on loan, 
Those are really important. Do you have them backed up? Do you have digital copies? Uh, one of the things we found during Hurricane Katrina and Rita is a lot of institutions did have electronic backups. They had hard drive backups or server backups. But unfortunately, a lot of times those backups were still located in the same building. If your building is hit hard enough, that's probably not a good place for you to be. So do you have them backed up offsite? Do you have them on the cloud or in a server somewhere else? Uh, you can rent server space. There are lots of companies out there that will sell you server space or rent you server space that you can pick. They're located completely on the other side of the country or far away from where you might uh, be adversely affected. So for example, if you live in the Gulf Coast, uh, if you're in a hurricane prone area, you're going to want to back up all your digital records to somewhere completely else in the country. So is there any way that you could do digital copies of some of your most important paperwork, uh, photographic records, maybe uh, artist interviews, that sort of thing. So that should be a high priority to start. Uh, of course, they're not ever going to be as important as the original, but having backups for things like that, that are most vulnerable. And when we talk about the collections, you know, there's some things that are very vulnerable, paper, books, parchment, photographs, um, mixed media objects, uh, things that, um, you know, if one type of material expands and contracts at a different rate uh, due to temperature shifts or water, are they going to separate? Um, so these are the kind of things that we really need to look at and consider those are the most important. We need backup plans for how to prepare uh, if water intrusion or the HVAC fails or things like that. As opposed to myself as a conservator, I work luckily on the very bottom of this list. You know, I work with metals uh, and I work with um, outdoor sculpture, things like that. So a lot of times I'll get called to institutions or after disasters and you know, I'm I'm the person with good news to say, oh, your bronzes, they're going to be just fine. Let's wash them off later. You should go worry about those paintings that you have. Um, so, you know, if you, your institution has a large outdoor sculpture garden and it gets flooded, probably not a big issue. We're probably going to be okay with that. But of course, you know, your your veneered um, furniture, period furniture, we, we need to get that uh, drying as soon as we can. So thinking about uh, sort of a triage and priority for your actual collection. And of course, you know, I've talked about materials, but just as important is what is most important to your collection? Are you a collection that specializes in a certain uh, type of art or type of artifact? Are those the most important? Do they have high maybe monetary value, maybe research value? Uh, I know a lot of institutions I've talked to and worked with in the past, their most important objects in the entire collection are those that are on loan to them. Um, so really figuring out like what's the most important thing, how are you going to deal with that uh, if a disaster is coming or if there is an emergency in that gallery or in the, in the building, um, you know, sort of prioritize what that is. And, you know, a lot of times when we're looking at triage, when we're coming in after a disaster, it's it's very daunting. You know, everything is moved around, everything is damaged, and I've worked at institutions where they're they're worrying about books, and you 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 have to say, you know, all these are commercially available. Just walk out of this room and forget it. None of this stuff matters. It's hard to get your mind wrapped around that when you're looking at, you know, floodwaters have been in, everything swirled around. You know, our records, oh, those are backed up. Just walk out of this room. Don't even worry about it. We need to go into the gallery and worry about the works of art or the paintings that aren't um, commercially available, that are that are one-offs, that are one-of-a-kind works of art. Those are, of course, the most important thing, maybe historic artifacts, you know, whatever it is. Um, and that sounds weird. You know, how are we going to prioritize your life's work um, as a curator or or you know, as a um, institution head, uh, but we have to because when the time comes, there may be only certain things uh, that we need to work on or that can be salvaged. 
Um, so know your building. Think about your building. Think about the worst case scenario. How is our building going to handle that? Um, this is a good example. This is in a, an institution that we worked at. And right by the most important records were louvered windows that all blew open and blew out uh, during the hurricane. So lots of water damage. No one had really thought about that. So are you in a flood zone? Is everything stored in the basement? We see that a lot. Where are the shutoffs? Is that giant pipe that runs right through the gallery, is that the main water supply for the whole building? It could be. Um, so think about these kind of things. Sort of walk your building and think about worst case scenarios. Um, you know, what could happen here? Uh, I know, for example, in my own institution where I work, uh, we have emergency air vents. More than once now uh, in a, a storm, the louvers for those blow open and it rains and floods right directly beneath those emergency air vents. Uh, we didn't know that the first time it happened. Things were damaged. Now we know if there's an imminent disaster, everything moves away from the air vents. Uh, actually, now nothing is stored near them. But it's sort of that thought process. What's the worst thing that could happen in this building? Um, can we prepare for that? Okay, so planning. Remember, proactive, not reactive. So do we have a disaster plan? Does everyone know the disaster plan? Maybe you have one and only a couple of people even know about it. Have you trained all the staff involved? Are there supplies for that? Are other groups that need to be involved, have you told them? Like your local fire department or your local police department, uh, do you have a working relationship with them? Uh, one of the greatest disaster plans I've ever seen uh, is in the state of Texas, uh, Bayou Bend, um, house museum. Uh, I did my emergency training there and they were explaining that not only, of course, this is a very important house museum, but their, their gardens are really important to them. So they already have a contract in place with a tree company that has their emergency plan. That tree company has all the information they need. So if something happens, that tree company already knows what's important, what to do, you know, that takes a lot of prior planning. So talk to the people that might be involved, the people you want to be involved. Maybe you have a very large uh, paper or book collection. Maybe you need to go ahead and contact these large uh, firms that freeze and can transport materials to talk to them and say, we're in a hurricane prone area, we're in a flood prone area, we just want you to know who we are and what we have. And a lot of them will actually send someone out to photograph and talk with you and help you come up with a game plan in case they're needed in the future. Hopefully, none of this is ever needed. But if it is, you want to know um, who to call and not this, well, let me start Googling companies that will come and uh, haul off and freeze and dry our paper objects. You want to already know that. And it's really important if you, to come up with a disaster plan, to train your staff, and to inform everybody. Because the worst thing you want is after a hurricane or after a large disaster, you don't want every volunteer at the museum showing up. And we're going to talk in a minute why you don't want them all showing up. But you want to know that they know, oh, this isn't my job. My job is to wait until they call me. Or my job is to show up immediately because I'm the first responder to get there and just figuring out what, what damage there is and, and, and what to do. So a contact list. And of course, we all have an amazing computer in our pocket that has our phone and our uh, contacts are already in it and our camera, all that's in our phones now. But the reality is for those who have lived through large scale hurricanes, that phone may not work at all. Um, you may be out of power and now I've lost my contacts. I don't know Steve's number. I, I only have it in my phone. Or I don't know the people who work for me's numbers. I have a contact list with everyone's job on it so that everyone knows, oh, I'm not supposed to do anything unless I get this call. Or yes, my job is to show up. 
Uh, for example, when I was on the emergency response team in Savannah, hurricane warning came out. When it hit a certain a level of warning, I knew my job was to grab my drop bag and to go to the cemetery. I knew my uh, jobs. No one had to tell me. It had all been practiced. Uh, I knew what my job was. and I knew where my supplies were. If you're a first responder into your institution, you may want to consider having all of your equipment, of course, at home. If your institution gets hit, that PPE is probably gone now. So, for example, I'm on FAIC's emergency response team, the National Heritage Responders. My drop bag is actually in my attic. I put it there in case, for some reason, my house ever floods. All my PPE I know is safely stored. Uh, Tyvex, respirator, uh, N95s, all that's ready in case I have to go somewhere including my own institution. So of course, one of the most important things, uh, dplan.org. I highly recommend that everyone go check this out. Um, make an emergency plan for your institution, uh, be it a very small one or a very large one. Dplan is amazing. It walks you through how to do all of this that we're talking about. So please, please check that out. Another good resource uh, I mentioned earlier, of course, is uh, FAIC and AIC. This is a great uh, resource page. If you hit that QR code right there, it'll take you to it. Uh, but working with emergency responders, does your local police or fire department know the kind of collections that you have and, and how your institution is on the inside? Uh, for example, I work with our fire inspector every few years. I explain where all of our stuff is stored, all of our gas tanks and, and solvents and that. In case we ever have a disaster, I don't want them walking into a blank slate. I want them to already know, okay, in these rooms, I have to be really careful. We have lots of gas cylinders and that sort of thing. All right, so one of the most important things as I wrap up is to think about is building reentry. A lot of people don't think about this. Uh, it's all about the collections, but Afterwards, can you get back in? I talked about sort of having PPE at home if you if you can, um, but having someone who is a first responder for your institution with a knowledge to know this building is not structurally sound anymore. I'm sorry, we're done. Uh, we we can't go in. Uh, you know, you're the most important part of this. Uh, you're not replaceable. I know the collections are really really important. They're and a lot of times, this is our entire life's work. Um, you know, our, our passion and our obsession is the collections. But we have to really be careful and remember that how important that we are and our employees are. Um, so, having someone on staff who knows how to turn the gas off to the building, how do we turn the wire, the electrical off for the building? Uh, I bet a lot of employees. Uh, don't know this, so it's really important. Whoever is those first, whoever those first responders are, that they know how to tell if the building structurally sound. Um, how do we access galleries and access floors without elevators? Uh, all of those things. And sort of wrapping up, you know, we come up with a disaster plan. Train your staff at least once a year. In prepping this, I realized. We have new employees at my own institution that I know I've never gone over this with, and I feel guilty of that. It's like, oh, I'm supposed to be teaching this. I'm not doing a good job. We need to do this again so that they all know, how do we turn the electrical off? How do we turn the gas off? Do you have PPE? Where do all of our most important assets, our original lab notebooks, where do those go if a storm is coming? So remember your training. Don't do it by yourself. You know, always work in a buddy system, wait for someone else, have two people entering the building at all time. Make sure that someone knows that you've gone to the building and that you're going into the building before you do. Uh, of course, we talked about PPE. And of course, if you're in there, maybe this is the only time you get in for a long time. So document it, bring a camera with you, bring your phone with you, anything that you can do to document the condition and the things that you see. Uh, those are going to be really important for planning. They're also going to be really important. Like I said, what if you are able to go in, but no one's able to go in for another few days because of other emergencies or the building is deemed unsafe? You'll be able to know uh, what, what's going on. 
And of course, coming up with that prioritization plan of your collection. Uh, where is it going to go? Do you have a place uh, that you could dry it or store it? Uh, do you have any long-term salvage plans? Have you talked to uh, other entities? Have you talked to professional companies? Do you have conservators uh, that you work with that you could call at this time? So all these things need to be in your preservation plan, in your disaster plan. I want to throw a last plug in here. Um, we're there when you need us. As I mentioned earlier, I'm a member of the National Heritage Responders. So that number is an important one. Uh, that is a 24-hour hotline that's managed by volunteers. Uh, if you have a disaster, by all means, call us. It doesn't matter if it's 2 in the morning and the flood rotters are receding. Uh, give us a call. We're, we're there to help you in any way that we can. Sometimes it's deployment. Uh, sometimes it's putting you in touch with the people in your area um, that can help you. But whatever we can do, uh, and maybe it's just answering a simple question for you. Uh, but we're there for you. We want to help you. So thank you very much. And I hope you got something out of this. Um, I know I've got a lot out of our other speakers. <laughs>